the Russian Air Force is still flying. For all the weapons that we have given to the Ukrainians, the one thing that the Ukrainians are not getting that they want, and you heard it in Robert Sherman's piece, you also have heard it from the Ukrainian president. They want a no-fly zone. They are not getting one. Here is Secretary Blinken explaining why. The only way to actually implement something like a no-fly zone uh, is to send NATO planes into Ukrainian airspace and to shoot down Russian planes, and that uh, could lead to a full-fledged war. As we look at the big map to give you perspective, Ukraine is the size of Texas. So keeping Russian planes out of here would mean putting U.S. planes all through here and U.S. air assets. To protect them, you would have to take out Soviet air defenses, Russian air defenses, inside of Russia here. That involves starting a war. We bring in General Phil Breedlove, retired four-star general, former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. General, I know you're in favor of a no-fly zone. We'll get to that in a second. Is the administration telegraphing to the Russians over and over that it's off the table a good idea? Well, I, and for a military person, uh, you don't want to telegraph your intentions to your opponent. But I, I don't want to. Uh, that's not the fight that we need to be fighting. What we want to talk about is how we could maybe get to a yes. And one of the proposals, as you know, is we have discussed now the possibility of a humanitarian no-fly zone, possibly over a limited part of Ukraine, in order to be able to get humanitarian relief in and to get the wounded and the problems out. Is that, would that be a no-fly zone that's agreed to by the Russians or unilaterally put in place by NATO? So the explanation that uh, I had several days ago with you and others, uh, we talked about that sort of military no-fly zone, which is exactly what Secretary Blinken was talking about, and he's right. It is an act of war. You will shoot down those that come in, and you have to take down the ground forces that are firing at you in the zone. But a humanitarian uh, no-fly zone can be written with different rules of engagement, ROE such that we can be much less belligerent. It's not perfect, and there still are those tripwires that could lead to bigger conflict, but it is the kind of zone where you inform and you talk to your opponent and say, we will not fire unless fired upon, we will not fire on you, we're here to protect those that are trying to get humanitarian relief in. And so it's not perfect, but it's something that we should at least look at and discuss. There is this deconfliction line now between the U.S. military and the Russian military, which I guess is where you'd have these kinds of conversations. Um, at some point, though, you have to think that Vladimir Putin, who's defied the world, if he wants to bomb something, he's going to bomb it, even if it's a humanitarian corridor. And then the U.S. is either seen not enforcing a no-fly zone or is shooting down a Russian plane. You're exactly right. As I said, this is not perfect. And it depends a lot about the, the intentions and the rationality of your opponent. Hmm. And the worrisome thing here is that we see Mr. Putin's intentions. They are exactly as you described. And we see some pretty irrational attacks on human lives in Ukraine. So there, this is, again, not a perfect solution, but one that I don't think we should necessarily take off the table. And we should look at how to revive refined to have the best luck. Yeah, you spent a lot of time across the table from what is now Putin's generals um, and studying Vladimir Putin. What do you make of the difference between the war now and the war in 2014 that I was there for? You think about the amphibious assault that's coming on Odessa. You think about this intent to take over uh, the entire country. Are we to believe this is a different Vladimir Putin or simply a Vladimir Putin who has been emboldened? I think it's both, actually. The war in 14, he had some pretty limited uh, objectives. He, he still believes that Crimea is his and a part of Russia. It is not. It is the Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea, which is now occupied by Russian forces. And he had limited objections or objectives in the Donbass. And I think in 14, his biggest message was, I'm going to invade and occupy a chunk of Ukraine so that it will not go into NATO. We all know that a, a, a nation with an ongoing war or a border dispute is, is going to be very, very hard pressed to get into NATO. And I, 
I think that was a big part of what he was doing back then. But since he uh, has weathered the sanctions that we put on him then, and we told him the sanctions we were going to put on him now if he went into uh, Ukraine, he's made the calculus that I can weather this. And so now I'm about a bigger objective. And remember, Leland, the two papers that he told us to sign or there'll be other measures. Mm -hmm. We now understand what the other measures yeah. were. Yeah, but those well, two papers outlined a bigger problem yeah, than even bigger. Ukraine. Yeah, much, much, much bigger that will test a number of the red lines that the president's laid down. Um, we're going to have to go, but I just wanted to tell you, I'm realizing now you were the Air Force commander during the no-fly zone over Libya. I was a young reporter on the ground there, and we were awfully thankful to have uh, your pilots overhead. It was good to see you, sir. Thank you. Good to see you as well. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.